Hello everybody, my name is Tori Majani. Today, we're going to be talking about episodes 5, 6, 7, and 8 of Mashoka Tensei Season 1. Now, I will say, these episodes are really the first time that this show gets pretty uncomfortable. So if you don't like seeing 9-year-olds being groped, uh, maybe this isn't the review for you. Or series. Well, it is what it is. I'll try to get out uh, these vi videos in a reasonable time. My motivation is draining by the day, and these take a while to make. At least compared to my other content. The main reason I'm not doing an episode by episode review like I did with Freerin was because one, Freerin was still releasing as I was reviewing it, and two, uh, I feel like Mishoko Tensei is much more serialized than Freerin. I haven't really seen an episode that I would consider episodic yet. Uh, it would just be better to review it as a whole, but that would take forever and I want at least two chunks. Anyway, on to this to review. Let's Go. This is your warning for spoilers. Mushoku Tensei Java's Reincarnation is quite the interesting series, and you should absolutely experience it before you're watching this video. As well, this is a reminder that these are my opinions, and I'm simply stating what I feel and think about the series. If you disagree with any of my opinions, give me a comment down below, simply saying what you think I could have done to improve my comprehension and understanding of the series. However, don't spoil me please. This is my first time watching this series, and I want to go through it chunk by chunk. Without further ado, on to this story review. Why? Episode 5 of Mishoku Tensei, A Young Lady in Violence. We start off this trunk with Galen and Rudy as properly meeting for the first time. He tells him a letter from his father, which insults Galen, and explains that he got Rudy as a job tutoring a young noble, as well as Galen herself, who he would also teach in exchange for sword training. As well, Paul states that this will be for the next five years, in which he is forbidden from contacting anyone from back home, primarily because Paul wants to separate Rudy from Sophie. The final lecherous statement from Paul, while not liking it, Rudeus resigns himself to his fate. Rudeus meets with Philip Rayrat, Paul's cousin, who immediately schools him on noble etiquette. Nepotism! Philip brings Rudeus to his daughter, whom he initially describes as willful. We meet Eris. He approaches her, and she immediately rebukes him for being younger than her and disagreeing with her. He slaps him. He slaps her back. She claps back with the force of a thousand suns. He runs, hides, and lives for another day. Philip asks Rudy if he's going to give up, but he refuses. So he comes up with a plan. He prays over Rocky's amulet to find success. In the night, he wakes up to find himself and Eris kidnapped, which goes on with his plan. A big old thug comes over and beats her up. Real bad. Rudy heals her with healing magic, but not the whole way to encourage her learning. Rudy breaks out using the magic, then blocks the door. Eris isn't strong enough to move, so Rudius makes her promise not to use violence or shout. They get the heck out of there. Rudius heals the rest of her wounds, and Eris immediately breaks her promise and begins shouting. We find out that Eris can't read, do math, or magic. They hitch a ride in the carriage back to town, and are passed by several men on horseback. Walking through the streets, they encounter a servant of the Grayrot household. Eris gets yanked, and the servant reveals that he is betraying the family. They offer to let Rudius join in on the prophet, but he refuses in lieu of his duty. Rudy lights up a firework in the sky with magic and goes in the offensive with magic smoke bombs, mud, and fire magic. The sword flies towards him and we get a gizlane ex machina and the guys are dead. Rudy has a little bit of trauma from seeing people die though. They arrive back at the manor where the servant is taken away to have whatever done to him that kidnappers get done to? Rudeus reflects on his actions and Eris walks away. The episode ends with Eris turning around and giving him permission to call her Eris. And basically, the blessing to be her tutor. Now, onto my thoughts on the matter. I like this episode. Wow, Yatori like him Shoko Tensei episode. Is this, is this Christmas? Yeah, I thought this was a pretty good episode. It followed along the lines of a character scripting a plan to scare a person or something of the like, and the plan becoming all too real, and going out of control. No contact with his family for five years? I wonder how Rudy's is going to handle that. So far, he's shown like, no attachment to Zena, and only a begrudging respect for Paul. I guess the only place he's going to struggle is with Selfie. Well, at least Ghislaine seems, you know, pretty cool. We also get to meet uh, with some other members of the Greyrat family, Philip and Eris. Philip seems like a pretty decent dude. Uh, weird comment about Eris, though. Eris is the archetypal brat character. She's violent, headstrong, and unwilling to stand anything she considers a front to her pride. We don't get to meet her mother or grandfather in this episode, 
Um, I would assume one of them is the reason why she is this way. Although at nine years old, I don't know why she doesn't even know how the basics of reading and writing already. We get to know that she's had many tutors before and decimated them all, thus learning nothing. But that seems like the parents' fault at that point. Like, discipline your daughter. Jeez. If nobody can hire- if nobody can hire- can teach her to read, you teach her to read. I get this is a noble household, and they pride themselves on teaching- uh, like having servants do everything. But a noble also needs to know how to read and write to perform their duties as a noble. Uh, I'm seeing a general theme in the Grey Rat bloodline. Anyways, uh, Rudy is his plan. Classic plot twist, decently executed. Big ol' zoom in on the suspicious servant. <clears throat> Let me tell you something. When I first saw Eris getting absolutely stomped, I first thought that it was just shock value. You see this in so many shows nowadays, foremost in the public consciousness being like Amazon's The Boys, which seems to garner attention through incredibly like violent or degenerate acts. This may or may not be what the author's trying to do, but, but no idea. But even after she gets like stomped face first into the ground, her first words were like, I'm gonna tell Gramps, which really shows how genuinely insane Eris is. By God. If I were nine years old, and I just had someone smash my face in, I, I don't think those would be my first thoughts. I, I, you know, I, I would mostly be going, <laughs> or you know, something like that. Also, I know it's an animation error, or what I assume to be, where uh, when she gets kicked into the wall, the rope binding her hands just disappears, and isn't on the floor or anywhere afterwards. Uh, very proud of myself for that one. The scene where Rudius just kind of melts the stone around the bars was cool. The Rudius threatening Eris to leave her in the very active and real danger that he had realized was sad indeed. She breaks her promise immediately, which I completely expected. I grew up with these kind of people who I would keep my side of the promise, but they would just flake once I did it. I know now to never complete my part first. Yeesh. Uh, servant is a traitor. Dun dun dun. Uh, I was really, I was really interested in the spells used in this episode. Uh, foremost, the firework spell. I see red and green in there, so I assume he combined a fire spell with earth magic to touch the flame with strontium chloride for the red coloring, or copper sulfate for the green color. Which r really made me wonder: is this another unique spell, or is this Rudius summoning these specific compounds? Is that possible to do? As well as smoke bombs that Rudius summons, which I'm assuming is just using earth magic. To conjure powdery soil that, that is spread all over the air. Very cool. Uh, they get Galenex Machinud, and now Rudius has trauma. We do actually get to see this trauma in future episodes, but um, uh, not really after a few. We don't get to know what happens to the servant, most because his role in the story is served. And we finally get a bit of connection between Eris and Rudius, but uh, through their stubbornness and arrogance isn't gone. Uh, and I also do like this. The conflict isn't completely over in this episode, uh, just a little bit of it was solved. <clears throat> and I do wish Mishoko Tensei did this more often. Letting things play out over multiple episodes. Episode 6 of Mishoko Tensei, A Day Off in Roa. We begin with Philip and Rudy's having a chat, and officially, Glenn did everything. Apparently, other Gurats knowing about Rudy's existence is a big no-no. Eris' mother enters the room, and she seems to hold a disdain for Rudius. A man then barges into the room. Apparently, Eris' grandfather. Philip gets the big slap, and he requests that Rudius teach Eris magic. However, Rudius says that Eris should ask him himself. Eris! Oh! Eris asks by doing a cat pose and asking nicely. Yeah. Apparently, the masters are fond of Beast King. We see Rudius and Eris practicing swordplay, and Rudius teaching Eris magic. Making Roxy sculptures. Ghislaine is learning math, and Eris is burning down the manor. Apparently, Eris isn't fond of working. Rudius finds this 10-year-old girl Eris sleeping and gropes her breasts in her sleep. He then attempts to remove her underwear, but she wakes up and the Reddit heckin' wholesome physical comedy ensues, and he cries to Ghislaine about it. Eris seems to forget about being assaulted in the next scene. Ghislaine explains that she had gotten into trouble from not knowing math, running out of supplies, and having to eat monster poop. More swordplay happens, and Rudius gets beat bad. Without breaks, Eris goes cuckoo. A foray into town occurs. Rudius starts finding out 
of the exchange system of this world and man offers him an aphrodisiac. He questions Eris and Ghislaine in trade terms to further their learning. One gold piece equals about 100,000 yen, or $664 as of the current exchange rate. Eris wants to buy Rudy's a book, but doesn't have any money of her own, too. Rudy's gets paid two silver pieces, and Ghislaine gets paid two gold pieces. Rudy spots a floating castle in the sky, the residence of the armored dragon Perugius. One day off a week helps Eris greatly. As a gift, Rudy's is given the aphrodisiac from before, but he breaks it. The episode ends with Rudy is getting tickled tortured. Now, onto my thoughts on the matter. Compared to previous episodes, I don't think this one is as interesting. You do get to learn some lore related things to the Demon King Laplace, specifically this random floating island with a castle on it, the domain of the armored dragon lord Perugius. You meet the mother and grandfather of Eris, a frigid presence and a loud boisterousness. Uh, something interesting that I thought about a bit of this episode, Beastkin. So far, the only members of the Starving Tree we've seen so far, besides the butler, have been Beastkin. Uh, the butler tells us that this branch of the Greyrat family have somewhat of a Beastkin obsession, uh, which is why Eris did that cat pose. I think that in this world, uh, Beastkin are treated as second-class citizens, treated by the nobility as somewhat of an exotic luxury rather than as people. Uh, Eris' pose is made to present drooping ears, basically attempting to look like a Beastkin via imitation. This might be off, but it does remind me a bit of the minstrel shows from America in the early 19th century. In these shows, white actors would put on blackface and comedically perform racial stereotypes of African Americans. Though there were some black-only minstrel groups that also performed, this was a rarity. Now, this might be a stretch or some psychotic delusion, but this imitation of Beeskin for its cute parts represents the fetishization and objectification of a species slash race of people. Uh, demonstrating that the nobility, at least these nobles, don't see them as much of people as they are, rather as a fun diversion. Well, that's just what I hypothesize. If it's true, it's an interesting parallel to our world. If not, eh. Anyways, moving on. That scene. Rudy finds Eris sleeping, and sexually assaults Eris. The definition of sexual assault. Sexual contact or behavior that occurs without explicit consent of the victim. Rudius sexually assaults a sleeping nine-year-old and attempts to remove her underwear. Here's your reminder that Rudius is an awful person. But what does the show do to show this awful, horrible action against a child is evil? It plays silly, goofy music. When Eris wakes up, he just plays the edgy trope in the anime by punching the pervert. Then Rudius says that she outplayed him. The gravity of the situation seemingly is not understood by the show. This scene makes me uncomfortable. First of all, because a nine-year-old being sexually assaulted should make you feel uncomfortable at this scene. If you aren't, I really don't know what to say. I've seen other scenes similar to this in other media, and they all make me uncomfortable. Sexual assault in media is supposed to make you uncomfortable, it's supposed to make you see this horrible event happening, hate the attacker, and sympathize with the victim, along with any other themes that the author chooses to present. Something I've noticed with this story is that sexual assault isn't treated with much gravity. Lilia getting sexually assaulted? Just in casual conversation. Paul sexually assaults almost every woman he can get his hands on? Again, casual conversation. Rudy sexually assaults Eris here, and is never brought up again. Now, you might think that the author is trying to show here that in this medieval society, assault isn't taken seriously and women have no recourse but to bear it. But then why, why is it never brought up individual assaults again? Why do they treat them like they're funny? Instead of using these to portray the horrors of sexual assault, they're just brought up out of the blue and never discussed again. Other times, they're used for etchy humor, the scourge of anime community, and why anime fans are treated like the weirdos that some of them are, and some of the anime shows are. Trying to take off a nine-year-old's underwear for sexual purposes? That's a great joke. More of that in my animes, please. As well, Rudius never shows any form of regret or even guilt for this action. Ultimately, it comes down to how you interpret it, but I hate it. The rest of the episode is just nothing. Rudius learned the exchange rate. That's actually pretty interesting, but uh, everything else just isn't anything. Eris wants to buy Rudius a present by asking her grandfather. Rudius says no because it isn't her money. What's Rudius' solution? Have Eris ask for an allowance. It's literally the same thing. Rah. Literally everything else meh compared to all the episodes that came before this episode is just 
a big old boring compared with sexually assaulting a minor. Yippee. Gotta say, sometimes it's, it just seems like the author wants to delve into deep or dark subjects, but just doesn't go through with the actual idea of it. <sighs> <clears throat> Episode 7 of Mushoku Tensei, What Lies Beyond Effort. We open with Ghislaine and Eris practicing swordplay, with Eris's reflexes impressing Ghislaine. It's wintertime, and Rudius is still tutoring his pupils. They're both increasing in academic and magical prowess. Eris's mother still seems disdainful to Rudius. He's made a statue of Roxy with earth magic for his lecherous purposes. He's approached by a woman who asks for his help. Soon Eris will be 10 years old, and she needs to know how to dance to not be embarrassed at her birthday party. For now, she just asks for some of his lesson time. With that, Rudius gains some free time. With this, he looks at the books from Philip's library, especially those concerning languages. All languages that end in God. Rudius isn't getting the languages, and the woman from before asks Rudius to assist in teaching Eris to dance. Eris has conversation with Rudius sitting on some hay, while talking about how they have difficulty learning like, different things. Rudius and Eris practice together, following many times. Rudius passes time, telling items he's created, learning languages, messaging Roxy, and dancing with Eris. Roxy sends another letter to Rudius, who is still setting fire to children. Uh, Roxy has delivered a guide to learning the demon god language to Rudius, as well as found the statuette he made of her. Eris is a grandiose prodigy with many people, and eventually, the time comes to dance. No one asks to dance with Eris, but she messes up and flops badly. Many of the guests comment on her inability, so Rudius steps in to take the dance. Rudius tells her to close her eyes and treat it like fighting, and they begin to dance perfectly. Clap and a half. Rudius gets a lot of admirers, but Philip tells him not to draw attention to himself. Rudius gives wands to his students, Eris and Ghislaine. Ghislaine gives Eris a ring said to protect from wolves as a gift. Yippee! Rudius resists molesting a sleeping child for once. He walks around the manor and finds the grandfather piping a beeskin servant. They see a giant black hole with rings in the sky. Grandpa says not to worry about it, and the episode ends. Now, on to my thoughts on the matter. It feels like not a lot happened this episode. You get dancing, languages, more dancing, and foreshadowing. I could see say this episode serves as characterization, but... Eh. We don't really get any new information about the characters here. Eris' mother is still frigid, and the only conceivable reason being Rudius' perversity or something Paul did, the story isn't going to do that. Eris is bad at manners and dancing? Incredible for information. Who would have guessed? Hmm. At least the different languages seem interesting. Why do they all end in, uh, God? We see some more, uh, Reddit heckin' wholesome, awesome, etchy humor with Roxy's segment, uh, and Rudius resisting his anime fan urges to must a sleeping child. Would you call this character progression? Rudius never shows any guilt, uh, and the show never brings up Rudius' actions again, well, at least to my knowledge. There's uh, genuinely not much more I could say about this episode. The dancing animation was good. The grandfather piped the beastkin servant again looks like a parallel to America, where masters would use slaves for their own sexual gratification. Then there's a black hole with rings that he just says to ignore it. What? Huh? Anyway, that's, that's, that's all I have to say. Episode 8 of Bushoku Tensei. Turning Point 1. We commence with Rudius studying some languages, and Eris training Ghislaine. The black hole is growing bigger. Rudius discovers that the people of the manor are preparing a surprise for his 10th birthday. We also find out that there are four branches of the Garnet family, and they are constantly vying for power between one another and themselves. Ghislaine tries to keep Rudius distracted, and he uses the opportunity to ask about her tail, which is attached to her tailbone. Rudius enters his surprise party and cries for emotional manipulation purposes. Family dynamics get brought up, and Eris' mother offers both to adopt him and marry him off to Eris. Aye, aye, aye. For his birthday, he is given a staff, Aqua Hardia. The party commences, and all have great mirth. Philip tells us that he uh, lost a secession dispute, and that all sons are to be taken and raised in the capital, which we can see Rudius was not. Eris' mother was angry about that, and reviled Rudius due to her own children being taken away from her. He asks Rudius if he wants to marry Eris, saying that he'll handle the coup, and makes a weird comment about Eris. Rudius doesn't want any part in the power struggles, however, Rudius can think of only naturalist things. He finds Eris in his room, not very dressed. Rudius, quote, My first time could be with a haughty Sundare Lali's first time. My first first time. End quote. She says to stop. Despite knowing that Philip sent her to do this, he touches her breast again and immediately undresses, touching her groin. She then punches him. Rudius is sad that he will never lose his virginity. He apologizes to Eris when she reappears again, and she forgives him. She says not until five years in the future. Rudius celebrates. We cut to Paul and an adventurer group dealing with wild beasts in the homestead. The children are growing up and 
things seem much the same as ever. Lily's child is being used as a maid. A dark cloud approaches on the morrow. Roxy sees it as well in her post. A man walks the slopes of the mountains alone, attacked by dragons, yet seemingly unaffected completely. He looks into the dragon's eye and flies off. Mana is gathering. The lolly demon lord marches forward. The armored dragon lord sends a servant to eliminate the source of the mana. With his new magic staff, Rudy is going to demonstrate his magic, but is interrupted by a mana disturbance and an attack from an unknown source. The servant of an armored dragon lord talks briefly, then disappears. The black hole implodes, and a white light fires out. Then the episode ends. Now, onto my thoughts on the matter. We'll get to that part soon. For whatever reason, not a single person brings up the black hole, even when it grows bigger. Which it does make me think that only people with great amounts of mana can see it. Which includes Rudy's and grandfather at this part, mayhaps. Speculation and assuming is really all I have here because usually we don't get answers for most shows until seasons later. Uh -huh. Rudy is utilizing the people who apparently love him and are playing a surprise party for him to manipulate their emotions by fake crying to strengthen the sociopath argument. I do get the way Eris's mother was acting towards Rudius now, though. Uh, it makes sense. It's interesting to see how they're now explaining family politics when y you know what the next arc is. Seems like a weird place to put it, I guess. Uh, they're just doing more setup stuff, like the super thing. Now, let's get into that scene that people think of when they think of this episode. Oh god. Well, uh, I guess they've been building up to it. Rudy is groping Eris while she's sleeping, attempting to move her underwear. Then he takes a step back. He doesn't grope Eris while she's sleeping. And I know what you're thinking. This is a new path for Rudius. He's become a better person. He knows not to exercise his lust on t t t 10 year olds. But uh, nah. Philip places Eris in Rudius' room to entice him towards marriage. Eris tells him to stop. Rudius gropes her breasts again, then touches her groin. Then once again, the heckin' wholesome Reddit physical comedy happens, and he gets punched. Then, like Sylvie, th though what Rudius did to Eris was much worse, she immediately forgives him. For Sylvie, it took at least a day. I'm just. <laughs> And the music they played during this was like this. Characters can do bad things. Just don't treat the bad things like they're funny, humorous, or not a big deal. And as always, the sexual assault are never brought up again. They just forget and never talk about it again. Make Rudy a bad person, but give him consequences. Any consequences. At all. Jesus. Just in case some of you don't know, a 10-year-old cannot consent. Yep, even with another quote-unquote child. That's not how it works. Moving on, the mysterious black hole does something mysterious. Wowee. I'm so tired at this point. Ugh. We see some more new characters. The guy on the mountains seems strong. The demon lord Lolly seems to be a staple in the genre. And the armored dragon lord himself, Perugius. A big flash of light and the episode ends. <sighs> I'm going to go lay down. These have certainly been episodes of Mishoko Tensei. God, everything but episode 5 was just... Ugh. The constant sexual assaults just make me scree... And now they're treated like etchy humor, just a slap and they're never mentioned again. I am so tired of this, and I'm assuming that this isn't going to stop. The argument that many people use is that Rudy's is a bad person so he does bad things, and sure, I get it, but the show doesn't treat them as bad actions. It treats them as funny, haha, hee hee little things, that they can be resolved in a slap. It doesn't help that they play this stupid gosh darn music over the scenes every single time. It destroys the gravity of the situations and does make it seem like the show doesn't even uh, see sexual assault as the evil thing it is, or even a bad thing, and it never gets brought up again. It sucks. Shoko Tensei has the chance to talk about these really hard topics, about a bad person who's given another chance. But so far, he's just using the second chance to sexually assault children. And it does suck how this is how many people view anime as a whole. Oh, anime? You mean those cartoons where they sniff panties and molest children? And this is literally the case of this anime. I'm so tired. The next chunk, 9 through 12, I'm at least not going to be disgusted by, but one thing was significantly dumber. Whatever. Episode 5 was really the only one I particularly liked from this and would watch again. Well, that's the second chunk of episodes done. 5 through 8. We had some good times, some bad, not so good times. It was certainly experience. Well, you know what to do. Subscribe, like, comment how offended and biased I am, uh, and have a great time. Thank you all for watching to the end. I do want to talk about something real quick, though. After I finish Mishoko Tensei, I'm uh, going to try to do something other than reviews or criticisms of media. I'm finding that I can't even watch my favorite shows without picking out uh, every less than perfect part of it and enjoying them less as a whole. The looking for problems mindset really gets to you. Anyways, look forward to my schism ranting over hair in the next review.
This has been Tori Majori. Our Mishoka Tensei streams are on Monday. Then I'll see you later. Bye 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 bye